Could we repair missions to L2 like James Webb and Gaia? Polaris Dawn returns to Earth. Did our planet once have rings and a peanut shaped asteroid just drifted past Earth? All this and more in this week's Space Bites. We got some great news when the James Webb Space Telescope launched from Earth. It turns out the Ariane upper stage had put it on exactly the right trajectory so that it was going to reach its final location at the Earth Sun L2 Lagrange point, about 1.5 million kilometers from Earth. And the orbit was going to be so good that it was going to last a lot longer than anyone had originally expected. And that's great. And yet that is still a finite lifetime. At some point between the next 10 to 15 years, James Webb will run out of propellant, it'll drift out of the L2 point, and it will no longer be a functioning telescope. And it's not just James Webb. Gaia has almost reached the end of its lifespan. Nancy Grace Roman telescope is on its way to L2. There's a lot of spacecraft they're going to be using this incredible location. And people always ask me, is there a way that we could repair, recover, refuel these spacecraft to give them a much longer time? And the general answer, the one that I've gotten from NASA and others is no, it's too far away. Although humans have been able to repair the Hubble Space Telescope, that's in low Earth orbit, like maybe 500 kilometers above the surface of the Earth. L2, 1.5 million kilometers away, that's farther than the moon. That is farther than the farthest mission that has ever happened. What about a robotic mission? We just never built a spacecraft designed to go all the way out there, dock, maneuver, and be able to repair or refuel a spacecraft. And so the sad answer is, nope, they have limited lifespan. But the real answer is maybe. Now, there's a couple of things to think about. One is that at the bottom of James Webb, there is the original docking ring, the thing that was clamped onto the top of that Ariane upper stage that has ports for propellant as well as electricity. And so theoretically, if you could get a spacecraft out to L2, you could dock and service telescopes like James Webb and Gaia and others. And now I saw a paper this week where people at NASA are starting to consider this possible mission. Now, they're only at the what kind of trajectory makes sense stage of this process. And they're considering two different trajectories. One is that you start in low Earth orbit. So you start in orbit around the Earth, kind of like how James Webb did originally, and then you fire burn that takes you all the way out to L2. The other possibility is that you fly up to geosynchronous orbit. And this is sort of like a halfway point gravitationally between Earth and the rest of the solar system. Then you refuel your spacecraft at geostationary orbit. Maybe there's a nice cool refueling center up there. And then you fly out to L2, dock with one of these space telescopes and give it a repair. So for now, the answer is no, but the answer could turn to maybe, and eventually we've got a mission planned to do this. So stay hopeful. Polaris Dawn returns to Earth. So the Polaris Dawn mission is over. And this was that private astronaut trip to space on board a Crew Dragon. They blasted off from Cape Canaveral on September 10th, and they went into orbit around the Earth for five days, returning on September 15th. And initially, they went into a really high orbit, getting up as high as 1,408 kilometers above the surface of the Earth. And when you think about the International Space Station down around 500 kilometers altitude, this is much higher. This is the farthest that humans have been from the surface of the Earth since the Apollo program. Then they changed their orbit down to one that brought them within 190 kilometers to the Earth at the closest and 700 kilometers at the farthest. And then two people on board went on a spacewalk. Now, they don't have an airlock on Polaris Dawn, so they had to actually open up the entire spacecraft to the vacuum of space. Two of the team went out onto the ladder and poked their heads out to be able to see space. Two remained inside, which must have sucked. I mean, you're you're so close to being able to just poke your head out and look at space itself, but they remained inside the capsule. They also did about 40 science experiments while they were out there in space. They were able to test a communications link between Starlink and you know, Starlink is designed to communicate down to the surface of the Earth. And in this case, they were a way above the Starlink network and still able to send communications to and from Starlink during their mission. Then they returned off the coast of Florida, returned to Houston, and I guess are still digesting all of the science and experiences that they had. So, you know, like I think a lot of people think, okay, billionaires having fun doing space tourism. And yes, 
there's definitely a lot of that. But you know, there were some new first some new pretty cool distance records new testing of a new spacesuit from SpaceX, as well as this umbilical that allows spacewalks. And so I think there's a lot of really useful science that was done as part of this mission as well. So congratulations to everybody who did this mission. And hopefully bring the cost down so the rest of us can go a peanut shaped asteroid just drifted past the Earth. So remember the Arecibo telescope, this is this giant radio telescope that was in Puerto Rico, and it gave us some incredible discoveries about the radio universe, but it also was equipped with a really impressive radar system. This is where it could beam out a pulse of radio waves at some target like an asteroid that was passing close to the Earth, and then receive the bounce signals coming off of that. And then astronomers were able to map out the surface of these asteroids through just radio waves alone. Well, Arecibo collapsed a couple of years ago, and there are no plans to rebuild it. But there is another telescope that can do the same thing. It's called the Goldstone Solar System Radar, and it is not as powerful as Arecibo, but it still has the ability to send out a radar pulse, receive the reflected signal and map out the surface of an asteroid. It got the perfect target just a couple of days ago. On September 16th, the near Earth asteroid 2024 ON passed within a million kilometers of Earth. And this was the perfect target to be able to scan with the radar instrument on Goldstone. The asteroid itself is about 200 meters across, and they were able to resolve details on its surface down to 3.75 meters. And if you like look at the image carefully, there are little bright spots speckled on the surface. And those are like individual boulders that are being revealed by the radar. And what's most impressive is that the object looks like a peanut. This is a very common object in the solar system. Astronomers call this a contact binary, where you've got two lobes, two asteroid lobes that are just gently touching together. Now kiss and astronomers think that about 14% of these larger asteroids in the solar system are contact binaries. So yes, we don't have Arecibo anymore, but we still can get new images of asteroids as they fly past the Earth. Earth have rings in the past. So when you think about the various large planets in the solar system, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, they all have a large, majestic ring system. Why doesn't Earth get to have a set of rings? The problem is that if you put a set of icy rings around the Earth, it would instantly turn into a comet that the radiation from the sun would vaporize this icy material, and it would just spray away into space itself. And very quickly, the rings would be gone. But what if you had a ring of rocks that would work? Unfortunately, that is also very bad news. Astronomers have found a collection of meteorite impacts around the Earth, as well as a layer that corresponds to about 466 million years ago, when a lot of asteroid material was deposited around the entire planet. And now a team of researchers think this could be explained that an asteroid came too close to planet Earth came within what's called the Roche limit, where the tidal forces the gravity coming from the Earth tear this asteroid into chunks and pieces. Those pieces would have then gone into orbit around the Earth. And briefly, we would have had a set of rings around the planet that you could watch as you went out at night. But then all of those chunks of rock are on decaying orbits, they'd enter the atmosphere and cause crater after crater after crater. So if we ever see a rocky set of rings around the Earth, that would be the time to panic. Earth will have a tiny moon. Now the Earth has one moon, the moon, and don't let anybody tell you otherwise, they're going to try and get you with their trick questions, they're going to say, how many moons does the Earth have? And you're going to say one moon, they're going to go, no, no, what about this quasi moon? And it's a trap. Occasionally, Earth does have a temporary dance partner that shows up for a couple of months, and then skips back off into space. And so recently, an 11 meter asteroid called 2024 PT five came within 567,000 kilometers of the Earth, and then it swung back out, but it was still trapped by the gravitational influence of the Earth and the moon. And so on September 19th, it came back and did another orbit and it's going to continue to orbit around the Earth until November 25th. Until then, it will be out of reach of the gravity of the Earth and the moon and will continue its trip around the solar system never to return. But you shouldn't really call it a moon a quasi satellite or a horseshoe orbiter, 
but not a moon. Wow. It looks like there have been like 50 of them in the last 100 years. This happens all the time. Every week, we do a vote on our channel where you tell us what you thought was the coolest space news of the week. And the winner last week was the Polaris Dawn Spacewalk. So thank you everybody who voted. Now we post the new vote into our channel within about 24 hours. We put it in the community tab, but you're gonna see it as you're just scrolling on YouTube, watching various videos, it's gonna show up. Give a second, give us a vote, and hopefully then YouTube will prompt you every week to give us a new vote. Now, if you've never seen the vote, then you need to subscribe to the channel, click on the notifications bell, and then watch a bunch of our videos to train the algorithm that you want to see more of this kind of thing. A new mission to Neptune. We need to go back to Neptune. Think about it. Like we haven't seen planet Neptune up close since the Voyager 2 mission went to Neptune in 1989. I was in high school. Some of you weren't born when this happened. And yet we have not had any close up images of Neptune since then. And Neptune is a fascinating world. It's an ice giant. And we know that there are a lot of examples of these ice giants across the universe. Many exoplanets are in this classification. Neptune has the craziest moon Triton, which orbits backwards from the rest of the other moons in the solar system. When Voyager flew past Triton, it got the faintest glimpse that there might be geysers coming off the surface of Triton. We need to go back. Not only do we need to visit Neptune, we need to land on the surface of Triton and understand it better. And so a new mission concept called Arcanum wants to do exactly that. Their mission consists of three separate parts. So the first part is an orbiter, and it'll look very similar to like Cassini or Galileo with a big dish capable of sending data back home. It'll also serve as a communications relay for the rest of the mission, and that's called Somerville. And then there's an orbital maneuvering unit that they're calling Tenzing, and Tenzing will carry the lander onto the perfect trajectory so that it can set down on the surface of Triton. But it also has three impactors on board. So once it's sent the lander on its way, it will fire these three impactors that will then collide with the surface of Triton, try to dig deep to get some evidence of what's going on beneath the surface of Triton. Maybe it can reach some kind of watery interior under the ice. The lander is called Bingham. It will set foot on the surface of Triton and then just understand its surroundings, the ice under its feet, the potential of a thin atmosphere, just the surface conditions of this really strange world. Now, I know you're probably excited about this idea. We get excited about all these Neptune missions. So here's the downside. If it does actually go through and gets built and launches by say 2030 on a super heavy rocket, like maybe Starship or Falcon Heavy, it would still not get to the Neptune system until 2045 before it could actually begin its science operations. But I can be patient. You can participate in a light pollution survey. Light pollution is getting worse. About 60% of humanity can no longer see the Milky Way. And like 80% if you live in the US or Europe. And that's a real shame. And this problem is just getting worse as more and more lights are installed. More of these lights are directed upward for some reason I do not understand. And although there's very little we can do to prevent the light pollution, at least we can track the problem. So researchers at a group called Gaia for sustainability have developed an open source off the shelf software hardware platform, they call free DSM free dark sky monitor. This allows anyone to follow their instructions, build their own photoreceptor and attach it to say their house, and then contribute data about light pollution for where they are into a central repository. And then all of the information is open source, scientists can go through it and study it and understand and track and like beg people to stop pointing their lights up into the sky. So if you are technically inclined, you've worked on maker projects before, if you own a 3D printer, uh, this is the kind of project that you might want to get involved in. As you know, I like to wrap up these videos with cool images or videos that we've found. And this one is great. So think about Breakthrough Starshot and this idea of sending spacecraft at 20% the speed of light from here to Proxima Centauri, flying past planets in the Proxima Centauri system, 
What would it look like? What would it feel like to be on a spacecraft that's moving through the system at that pace? So our friend of the show, Marshall Eubanks, who I've interviewed several times and is a recent NIAC recipient, he and his team have put together a visualization that shows what it would look like. And so you are one of the spacecraft in the swarm that is passing through the Proxima Centauri system. And you can see as the planet you're approaching at 20% the speed of light, and then you turn around and watch the planet in the rearview mirror as you continue to move through at 20% the speed of light. And like, yes, it's very fast. Yes, it's a very quick flyby, but you do get to see features on the surface of the planet, both hemispheres, it's pretty cool what would be possible. And like, wouldn't that be amazing if we could see the surface of another planet orbiting around another star. And one of the cool things about this swarm is that it's communicating with itself and it's communicating back to Earth, sending all of the data, the pictures, and they sort of represent this in the visualization. Now, if you want to learn more about this specific plan to explore Proxima Centauri, I've got an interview that I did with Marshall Eubanks here on the channel. So check that out. So thank you, Marshall, for producing a really nice visualization. We don't get this very much. We have amazing stories with NIAC, but a lot of the times it's just like a picture one and not a really cool animation like what we got this time. Now, while you're watching this week's episode of Space Bites, I am writing my weekly email newsletter, The Guide to Space. For example, here are some stories that we've got in the newsletter that you're not going to see here. Exoplanets could be hiding their atmospheres. A metal part was 3D printed in space for the first time, and astronomers have found a star with a hot Jupiter and a cold super Jupiter at the same time. Every week, the newsletter goes out on Fridays to 72,000 of my best friends. I write every word in the newsletter. There's no ads. It's completely free. You can unsubscribe anytime you like. So go to universetoday.com slash newsletter to sign up. Now I want to talk about how amateurs can get involved in space science. But first, I'd like to thank our patrons. Thanks to Abe Kingston, Adam Schaefer, Barry Lake Roofing, David Giltonen, David Matz, Dennis Alberti, Dustin Cable, Jeremy Mattern, Jim Burke, Jordan Young, Josh Schultz, Paul Rohrbach, scienceworldrecord.org, spiderswap.io, Stephen Krasaki, Stephen Fowler Munley, and Vlad Shiplin, who support us at the Master of the Universe level, and all of our other supporters on Patreon. I get asked a lot by viewers on how they can participate and actually contribute to the space science that's being done by astronomers. And maybe you don't want to go and get your PhD in astronomy, but you still want to contribute. And so this free DSM hardware that I mentioned in this episode is one way that you can get involved in tracking light pollution. But there's a lot of other projects that you can get involved in. If you just want to like stay at home and work on your computer. Um, there's of course CosmoQuest, which is an organization that I'm involved with. And the CosmoQuest community helped select the sample site for the Osiris Rex mission, they looked through 1000s of images of the surface of asteroid Bennu and helped pick the exact spot where Osiris Rex was going to collect a sample. There's the Zooniverse project where they've got Galaxy Zoo and a lot of other projects where people can look through images and help classify stuff about the universe. But if you've got some technology, some hardware, if you've got a telescope, you can actually get involved in other projects as well. You can help discover asteroids, you can help do variable star astronomy, you can help do gravitational microlensing, confirming exoplanets, and then some of the new smart scopes like the EV scope will allow you to contribute your data as you're scanning for asteroid surveys automatically. So you know, if you want to get involved in various astronomy projects, there's a lot of resources out there available. So get involved. All right, we'll see you next week.